In our studies this week, we're going to be focusing on Paul's epistle to the Ephesians. Today, we're going to go back into the Acts record and look at the formation of that ecclesia. And then in our subsequent studies, God willing, we're going to be looking at some aspects of the epistle to the Ephesians, some, some of the main themes that we find contained in that particular letter. So, to the founding then of this particular ecclesia. Well, Ephesus was the main city of the Roman province of Asia, now Asiatic Turkey. It lay on the west coast at the mouth of a river and on a major trade route inland. In fact, it was one of the great seaports of the ancient world. It was, not surprisingly, a wealthy and important place, with its agora, its marketplace, its libraries, its baths, its marble-paved streets, and its theatre. It occupied a huge area with a population of possibly a third of a million people. The great theatre in the centre of the city, which can still be seen today, would hold about 25,000 people. There was a road lined with columns that ran all the way through the city and down to the harbour. Um, the sea actually uh, isn't there now, of course, because actually even in Roman times, uh, the harbour tended to silt up, and over centuries that silting up has continued, and so uh, the sea is some 10 kilometres away. But in the first century, that road you can see there on the right hand of the picture would have run all the way down to the harbour. Ephesus was a free city. And that meant that the inhabitants didn't have to endure the indignity of Roman troops actually quartered within the city itself. It meant that the city had significant rights of self-government. It had its own magistrates, a democratically elected governing body, and an assembly of all its citizens, called, as I've put on the screen there, the Ecclesia. The main civic official is referred to in Acts chapter 19 and verse 35. In the authorised version, he is simply described as the town clerk. But this English term underrates his importance. He was, in fact, the man directly responsible to the Roman authorities for the kind of breach of the peace and illegal assembly as occurred here in the 19th chapter of the book of Acts. Ephesus was also an assize town, that is, a centre for the meeting out of justice. The Roman governor would visit at particular times of the year and he would try important cases. Each May, the Pan-Ionian Games were held here and crowds would descend on the city for this great sporting occasion. It actually has a very modern ring about it, doesn't it? In addition to its political, commercial and cultural importance, Ephesus was also famous in the ancient world as a religious centre, as I indicated in, in the introduction on Saturday evening. It was a strong centre of emperor worship and the temple to Artemis was regarded as one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. There on the screen you've got the seven wonders marked and... Uh, Actually, it's the oldest of those wonders, the pyramids in, in, in Egypt, that are still surviving. All the others have now disappeared. But the temple to Artemis was one of those wonders. To the Greek-speaking Ephesians, their goddess was Artemis. The Romans, however, identified her with their goddess Diana. And that's the translation that we have in the authorised version. This temple to Diana built after the previous one had been destroyed by fire in 365 BC, actually survived until its destruction by the Goths in AD 260. In the 1770s, the historian Edward Gibbon, in his monumental work, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, mourned the destruction of what he called one of the wonders of the world, Curiously, prior to the 19th century, it doesn't seem to have, have occurred to anyone to dig down and find remains of structures like this. 
The remains of the temple have now been found, and uh, if you look at the picture there, you can see an artist impression of what the temple looked like in its heyday, and on the right-hand side, you can see the remains of the place now, and somehow or other, those two contrasting pictures seem very fitting. This was, after all, an idle temple, and now there is virtually nothing left of it. That, of course, is what happens to everything man-made that is against the principles of the truth. The remains of this particular structure were found by a certain J.T. Wood in 1870 to the northeast of the city at the base of a hill. The dimensions of this temple were actually immense. It was four times, it seems, the size of the Parthenon in Athens. Inside the temple, there was an image of the goddess, a many-breasted figure, a symbol of fertility. It was claimed that this image had fallen from heaven. And this idea is actually reflected in the Acts record because the town clerk actually says to the people in verse 35, Ye men of Ephesus, what man is there that knoweth not how that the city of the Ephesians is a worshipper, or literally a temple keeper, of the great goddess Diana, and of the image which fell down from Jupiter. So that was the popular idea, that this had actually fallen from heaven, and indeed it may well have been a meteorite. The rabble-rousers in Acts chapter 19 claimed that all Asia and the world, Greek there, the inhabited earth, worshipped Diana. And there was some truth in this as silver coins from many different countries have been found carrying the inscription Diana Ephesia. You can see that on the left-hand side of the screen, Diana Ephesia. And uh, that is echoed, isn't it, in the cry of the crowd here in Acts chapter 19 when they cry out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. The Ephesian letters, which were really just magic charms, were sold from the temple in Ephesus. People bought them to be cured from illness, to have children, to have a safe journey, and so on. Ephesus as a city excelled in superstition, in what was, in any case, a very superstitious world. This temple also attracted criminals. The temple precincts were a place of asylum. If a criminal reached this place before being arrested, he was safe. Ironically, the temple was, re was regarded as being so inviolable that not only could criminals go there for safety, but money and valuables were also deposited there. So this place became very wealthy indeed. Now, just thinking about some of these points that we've outlined concerning ancient Ephesus, it might seem to have been a very unpromising place for preaching the truth. But we should be very careful about making those kinds of judgments. And certainly here in Ephesus, despite the kind of place it was, an ecclesia was formed. And the Apostle Paul stayed in Ephesus longer than he did in any other city. He had dealings with Ephesus on three particular occasions. Here in the Acts record, we find in Acts 18 and verses 19 to 21, he paid a brief visit, returning home from his second missionary journey. Secondly, on the third missionary journey, he stayed for some two to three years. And that brings us into the 19th chapter of Acts. And then when we move over to Acts chapter 20, on his last visit to Jerusalem, he met the Ephesian elders at Miletus. So we have those three sets of dealings with the Ephesians set out for us here in the Acts record. Now, as we say, he called it Ephesus briefly during his second missionary journey. And that was a journey that took the gospel to Europe. If we come back to chapter 16 of the Acts, the first European ecclesia was established in this chapter at Philippi. It was a Roman colony in Paul's day, named after Alexander the Great's father, Philip of Macedon. 
Paul was accompanied by Silas from the start, the end of chapter 15. At Lystra, the beginning of chapter 16 of Acts, they were joined by Timothy. And then at Troas, they were joined by Luke. So we've got a little group of missionaries here, Paul and Silas, Timothy and Luke. And I'm sure we're familiar with the fact that the only way that we know that, know that Luke is in the party is by the change of pronoun. We get the first person plural in chapter 16 and verse 10. After he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavoured to go into Macedonia. And that tells us that Luke has now joined the missionaries. It has been suggested that Paul's original intention had been to make Ephesus the centre of his work on this second missionary journey. But he was prevented from doing that. As Acts chapter 16 and verse 6 tells us, they were forbidden of the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. And that implies that probably he was going to make Ephesus the centre of his work. But the Holy Spirit said no. They were forbidden to preach the word in Asia at this particular time. Instead, as we find in the early part of chapter 16, the man of Macedonia beckoned them over to Europe. But on the return journey, Paul paid a brief visit to Ephesus, and he went into the synagogue, and in chapter 18, verse 19, he reasoned there with the Jews. They wanted him to stay longer, but he had decided to go up to Jerusalem for a feast promising to return if God will. And he did return on his third missionary journey, making Ephesus then the centre of his work, and he stayed, as we've said, some two to three years. So let's just have a look at some of the details, shall we? Come to Acts chapter 19, if you will, and we want to go in at verse 8. He went into the synagogue... Uh, Verse, uh, chapter 19, verse 8, he went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. But when divers were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. So the preaching then gets underway... But it says in verse 9 that some were hardened. They believed not. They were disobedient to the things that were being spoken about. And they spoke evil of that way before the multitude. That way, or as the revised version puts it, the way. They spoke evil of the way before the multitude. Now, the gospel reveals to all of us a way of life. Sometimes it's called a walk. In fact, that figure occurs many times in the New Testament. On other occasions, the gospel is called the way. You may remember that at the beginning of Acts chapter 9, we read that Paul went to Damascus with letters authorizing him to bring bound any that were of the way to Jerusalem. Instead, he himself entered the way. Later, Apollos was instructed in the way of God by Priscilla and Aquila. Well, here in Acts chapter 19 and verse 9, we find that there were those who spoke evil of the way. And we are reminded that there are actually two ways along which we can walk. The Lord Jesus spoke about them in Matthew chapter 7. There is the broad and roomy way that leads only to destruction, and there's the narrow way that leads to life. And the Lord made the comment about that, few there be that find it. And we, brothers and sisters, together with the faithful disciples in Ephesus in the past, walk in newness of life. We're walking along that narrow way. And like them, we need constant exhortation and encouragement from the scriptures to keep in it. Well, here in Acts chapter 19, faced with serious opposition to the truth, Paul separated the disciples from the synagogue and he conducted his preaching in the school, verse 9, of one Tyrannus. 
The word school indicates a lecture room. One of the modern versions, I believe, says lecture hall. So perhaps as we might hire a hall to have a preaching effort, so it seems Paul did something similar. He actually moved to this lecture room of Tyrannus and conducted his preaching there. Now, one of the, the Greek texts in this passage, the Byzantine text, adds the words, from the fifth to the tenth hour. In other words, from just before midday till the end of the afternoon. And if we ac accept that rendering, it's quite interesting because that would indicate that this would be the time when the work for the day was done and citizens would visit places of recreation. This would give Paul an ideal opportunity for preaching, both to the Jews and Gentiles in this city. Crowds, it seemed, uh, attended first the synagogue and then the lecture room of Tyrannus. In 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 9, Paul says that a great door had been opened to him in Ephesus. So there was a lot of enthusiasm, there was a lot of interest in the gospel that was being preached. But it wasn't just public preaching that Paul was doing on this occasion. He was also spending time with the disciples who were there. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 20, we're told that he went from house to house privately teaching the disciples. And it's perhaps just worth adding that... Uh, the hours of the morning then would have been free for Paul to work for his keep, which we know he did as he travelled. The Thessalonian Ecclesia was formed during Paul's second missionary journey back in Acts chapter 17. And when he later wrote to that Ecclesia, in both of his epistles to the Thessalonians, he makes the point, "'Ye remember, brethren, our labour and travail, for labouring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. He labored to look after himself. He worked to earn his living. He didn't want to be a burden on the ecclesia. It shows, doesn't it, his consideration for his brothers and sisters. Also, of course, he didn't want to be accused of scrounging or being out for personal gain. He didn't want to give ammunition to his enemies. We know that Paul was a tent maker by trade, the early verses of Acts chapter 18 tell us that. Apparently, even wealthy Jewish fathers used to make their sons learn a craft in order to prevent idleness or poverty later in life. So you can just imagine then, as a young man growing up in Tarsus, the apostle would have learned how to cut out and stitch the rough goat's hair cloth that was used in Silesia for the making of tents. It was poorly paid, and laborious work. Manual labour of that kind almost always affects a person's hands, and Paul's hands must have become hard and blackened. The skin would have become hard and blackened. And I think he does refer to this on one occasion. Just come across to Acts chapter 20 for a moment, and verse 34, where he says, Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. Now, he could just as easily have said, you know that I worked to look after myself. But he specifies the hands. And you can almost imagine him showing them the hands, using them as a visual aid. These hands, he says, have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. And they would see there the evidence of the hardened skin, a reminder that he had indeed worked to look after himself. Labouring night and day, he said to the Thessalonians. But that doesn't mean to say that he was working day and night. We, we, we shouldn't take that expression literally. It's actually an idiom. Apparently, it means that he started work before dawn, and he worked then into the day, into the early part of the day. No doubt in Thessalonica and again Ephesus, this would leave him time later in the day for the all-important work of preaching. But it's quite clear from all of this that the Apostle Paul was not a man with a great deal of spare time. And in the truth, 
we often find that to be the case. There's so much to be done. As well as our daily labour, we have our own work of preaching, attending ecclesial meetings, doing our readings or our Bible study, caring for one another. Life in the truth is, and indeed should be, very full. We all have to be doing whatever we can in the service of the Lord. Now, of course, the Apostle Paul, as we know, had a special commission, and he had special authority, which we do not have. When we hold our preaching campaigns or our Bible seminars, we can only present an argument based on Scripture. But the Apostle Peter makes it plain that we have a duty to do that. In his first epistle, chapter 3 and verse 15, he says, Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. We've always got to be ready, says Peter, to give an answer. And the Greek word for answer in that verse is apologia, from which we get our English word apology. But it's an apology in the old sense of the word, that is, a defence. We have always got to be ready to defend the truth that we believe, Peter is saying. And if we're going to be ready to explain the things that we believe, to give a defence of it at any time, it follows that first we need to have taken every opportunity of reading and studying God's Word, prayerfully at home, individually, with our families where we can, with our brothers and sisters, and that means regular attendance at the meeting where the Word is studied. This is all vitally important if we are going to fulfil this particular duty to our master. At home I've, I've got a little booklet that I picked up some 30 years or so ago, uh, written by a member of the Church of England, attacking Christadelphians for the things that we believe. And the, the, the author ta takes us through the doctrine of the Trinity and the supernatural devil, and she makes all the usual points that people do. But then at the end of this booklet, she makes a remarkable admission. She warns her readers that Christadelphians have a thorough knowledge of what they believe. Now, that is a reputation that was gained for our community by a previous generation, having a thorough knowledge of the things that we believe. It's a good reputation for us to have as a community but more important than that, it's actually our duty to the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, just coming back now to Acts chapter 19, the opposition stirred up in Ephesus to the preaching of the gospel was dramatic. Just come again to, to Acts 19 and verse 23, where we read, And the same time there arose no small stir about that way, about the way the way of the gospel. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen, whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation and said, Sirs, ye know that by this craft we have our wealth. Moreover, ye see and hear that not alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people saying that they be no gods which are made with hands, so that not only this our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised, and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worshipeth. Dramatic indeed was the protest now that gets underway in Ephesus. Now, gifts were made to Artemis. One inscription that's been found speaks of a gift of 29 statues of gold and silver which were to be carried to the temple in a public procession. And this perhaps helps us to understand the furor that's being described here in Acts chapter 19. Paul's preaching and the converts he made were seen as a threat to the livelihoods of Demetrius, who made silver shrines for Diana, and his fellow craftsmen. No doubt the souvenir industry was lucrative then, just as it is today. 
Further than this, however, Demetrius portrayed Paul's work as a threat to the temple and all it stood for. And when you think about it, his complaint was very skillful. People might not have been so concerned if it was simply a matter of his prophet's suffering, but it was much more serious to the people of Ephesus if Diana and her temple, attracting worshippers from all over the world, were being brought into disrepute. After all, Paul was saying that she was just an idol. And verse 26 suggests that scriptural arguments had been advanced against idolatry. Perhaps attention had been drawn to passages like some of those in the prophecy of Isaiah. Isaiah 44, for example, where the prophet says, They that make a graven image are all of them vanity. Isaiah has much to say about the folly of idol worship. and So maybe the Apostle Paul pointed to passages like that. They that make a graven image are all of them vanity. So, verse 28. When they heard these sayings, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And the whole city was filled with confusion. And having caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel, they rushed with one accord into the theatre. They were, it says, full of wrath. And here the Byzant text adds, and ran into the street. So presumably then, there was something of a protest march, which got underway in the marketplace on the right-hand side of the picture there, and made its way then into the theatre, which was next door. And Demetrius's fellow silversmiths responded to his reasoning by crying out, Great is Artemis, Diana of the Ephesians. And that's a cry that later is echoed by the crowd in verse 34. Now, the meeting that took place in the large open-air theatre was an official meeting of the Assembly of Citizens, the Ecclesia. And that term is used three times, the Assembly of Citizens. It's there in verse 32. Some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the Assembly, that is the Ecclesia in the Greek, was confused. The word occurs again in verse 39, where the town clerk says, if ye inquire anything concerning other matters, it shall be determined in a lawful ecclesia, assembly. And the word is there again in verse 41, when he had thus spoken, he dismissed the assembly, the ecclesia. So the meeting then that's taking place in this large open-air theatre was an official meeting of the assembly of citizens. And the aim of this meeting, clearly, was to put pressure on the city officials to deal with these troublesome missionaries. Verse 30. When Paul would have entered in unto the people, the disciples suffered him not. Now, there's a riot going on in Ephesus at the moment. There's a great crowd in the theatre crying out, greatest Artemis of the Ephesians, greatest Diana of the Ephesians. And Paul wants to go in and talk to them. What a man of great courage he was. He was willing to go into the midst of the people. But just as we have the word ecclesia in this chapter, the assembly of citizens, so we have also another term which is just worth pointing out, here in verse 30, when it says that the disciples suffered him not to go in unto the people, the Greek word there is demos, which is a term indicating the citizen body. The demos, the citizen body. He wanted to go in and talk to them, but the brethren restrained him, no doubt fearing for his safety. And this fear might have been all the greater because of a previous experience he'd had that is just referred to in passing in 1 Corinthians 15. Let's just keep a place, shall we, in, in Acts 19 and come on to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It's the great resurrection chapter. And we just want to pick out some words in verse 32. 
1 Corinthians 15 and verse 32, where Paul says, If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantageth it me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. I have fought, he says, with beasts at Ephesus. So Paul gives this as an example of his recent sufferings in Ephesus. As a Roman citizen, Paul was unlikely to be thrown to the lions, although it did occasionally happen to Roman citizens, but it was probably unlikely. But had it happened to Paul and he'd survived, he would have lost his Roman citizenship. And clearly from references later in Acts, we know that he was still a Roman citizen. That suggests to us then that the reference to beasts here is being used figuratively and probably it's a metaphor for a mob. When he says, I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, he is, I suggest here, talking about the mob in Ephesus. His life had been in danger. Furthermore, the aorist tense, the aorist tense that's used in this verse, implies a specific occasion, which no doubt would have been known to the Corinthians, although we just have it here in passing and we don't have any detail. And if, as seems very likely, this incident referred to in 1 Corinthians 15 preceded the one in Acts 19, it perhaps helps to explain the anxiety of Paul's friends that he should not enter into the arena on that occasion. We do know that on one of these occasions, Priscilla and Aquila had endangered their own lives for him. There's a reference to that in Romans chapter 16. Just uh, staying with this idea of the Greek word demos, the citizen body for a moment, that's referred to in Ephesus, the same term is also used a few pages back about Thessalonica. Let's just go back here for a moment. It's a small digression, but I think it's worth it. Acts chapter 17, where Paul and Silas come to Thessalonica, and there are some converts made as a result of his early preaching there. But then when we get down to verse 5, the Jews in Thessalonica have heard enough, and it says that those who believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, the rabble, and gathered a company and set all the city on an uproar and assaulted the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. The demos, the same term again. Now, the Jews who were opposed to Paul, being jealous, no doubt, of the success of his preaching, would have found it relatively easy to create this kind of disturbance. The agora, the marketplace, was always the centre of life in a Greek city. Groups of layabouts used to congregate there, perhaps hoping to hire out their services, as with the labourers in the vineyard, the parable that the Lord told in Matthew chapter 20, or else they were simply there looking for mischief. The authorised version expression, lewd fellows of the baser sort, is, I think, a very good description of a rabble. It's perhaps more clearly rendered in modern English by certain wicked men of the rabble. And the Greek term for of the rabble literally indicates market loafers. And no doubt bribed by the Jews, some of the worst elements amongst these idlers stirred up the city. Soon there was an uproar and the house of Jason was stormed by a mob. Now, they obviously expected to find Paul and Silas there, but they didn't. So disappointed, we're told, they drew, or literally, verse 6, they dragged Jason and some other brethren to the city magistrates. We have it translated here in verse 6 as the rulers of the city, the city magistrates. The Greek term there is politar. Luke uses the correct technical term for the rulers of Thessalonica. And he uses a term again in verse 8. They troubled the people and the rulers of the city, the politarchs, when they heard these things. 
So Luke's accuracy then as an inspired historian is very clearly shown to us in his correct use of the technical term here. We have the demos, the citizen body, and the politarchs, the rulers of the city. The original intention of the mob here was to find Paul and Silas and, as it says, bring them out to the people, the demos, the citizen body. Again, you know, the, the, the use of this term demonstrates the accuracy of the record. Now, Thessalonica, like Ephesus, was a free city, and as such it had its popular assembly, referred to in verse 5 as the people, the demos. Before this assembly, Paul and Silas could be charged. In the event, however, as they couldn't be found, Jason and other brethren were dragged not before the demos, but before the politarchs. So when you look at the original words here, you can see that there was actually a change of plan, which we might not perhaps realise with just a quick read of the text. There was a change of plan. The reason for the change of plan isn't given. It's been suggested that the assembly might have treated fellow citizens more leniently. Or perhaps it was just more appropriate to indict citizens before the politarchs. So now then, these disciples are set before the magistrates in Thessalonica. The accusation was one of treason. They've turned the world upside down. That accusation couldn't possibly be sustained, but equally, it couldn't be ignored. There was always the risk that Thessalonica might have its privileges removed by the imperial government if the city authorities failed to act appropriately. And of course, the same concern later was there in Ephesus. Uh, the chief clerk expresses that concern, doesn't he, in Acts chapter 19. Well, here in chapter 17, the magistrates want to take the heat out of the situation. So, in verse 9, they take security against any further disturbance of the peace from Jason and the other brethren brought before them. Ramsey, in his book, Paul the Traveller and Roman Citizen, suggests that this clearly implies that these men were bound over to prevent the cause of the disturbance, the Apostle Paul, as they saw it, from coming back to Thessalonica. And this was a great grief to Paul. We know from the first letter to the Thessalonians, he really wanted to go back <coughs> and strengthen this new ecclesia. But, as he says, Satan thwarted us. Satan blocked our way. Satan hindered us. The adversary in Thessalonica was there. And while the magistrates held to their policy, their attitude, Paul couldn't return. Now, of course, this was all in the purpose of God. Actually, there was more important work for the Apostle Paul to do elsewhere. So he has to be content to send Timothy back to Thessalonica. And the report that he received showed that while there were some issues here in this ecclesia, it didn't need Paul's personal presence to sort them out. And so his way back was blocked and he was directed to preach elsewhere. Sometimes for ourselves, brothers and sisters, we find there are things that we want to do in the truth, but somehow or other circumstances conspire against us and, and we can't fulfill those things that we want to do. Well, in those circumstances, like Paul, we have to go on in faith, serving our Heavenly Father in whatever way we can, in whatever avenues are opened to us. Well, back now to Acts chapter 19. It was not only the brethren who appealed to Paul not to go into the theatre. When we come to verse 31, we have reference to the chief of Asia. So chapter 19 then and verse 31, which says, Certain of the chief of Asia which were his friends, sent unto him, desiring him that he would not adventure himself into the theatre. Well, who were these chief of Asia? The Revised Version translates that as chief officers. The Revised Version margin gives the rendering Asiarchs. The Asiarchs, which were his friends, sent unto him, desiring that he would not go into the theatre. Now, these Asiarchs are frequently mentioned in inscriptions, 
and they appear to have been the heads of the, of the provincial cult of Rome and the emperor. It was their duty to look after the rights of the imperial cult. The position was held for a year, but individuals retained that title even after their term of office had been completed. So I, I suppose it's a bit like American presidents who serve their term of office, but after that they're still entitled to be called Mr. President. And so it was with these Asiarchs. They served their term for a year, but retained the title after their time of service was complete. So there could therefore have been several Asiarchs at any one time in Ephesus. It was an office of public honour, and those appointed would usually belong to the aristocracy. They weren't necessarily fanatically devoted to the cult of Diana. Some were clearly tolerant of and even friendly towards the Apostle Paul. I think, you know, when, when we come back to the record here, there is a hint of sarcasm in Luke's comment in verse 32, albeit under inspiration, that many of the crowd who had rushed with one accord into the theatre didn't know why they were there. That's the point he makes, isn't it? Some therefore cried one thing, some another, for the assembly, the ecclesia, was in confusion, and the more part knew not wherefore they were come together. It's the real mob mentality, isn't it? You know, they were all crying out, great is Diana of the Ephesians, but many of them, says Luke, had no idea why they were there at all. Just typical of a mob. And in contrast to his use of the term for the citizen body, the demos, in verses 30 and 33, later in verse 35, when again we have reference to the people, Luke uses a different term altogether. He uses a term in Greek that simply indicates a crowd or a mob. So they might have begun then in an official capacity as a citizen body, but as a result of this crowd mentality, this just endless crying out, greatest Diana of the, Fe of the Ephesians, they just become a mob. And we come down then to verse 35. The clerk of the people. He was the main magistrate of the city in Ephesus and some other cities of Asia Minor. In other Greek towns, he was just an administrative assistant. This man now in Ephesus was best placed to quieten the assembly and deal with the accusation of the silversmiths. And that's what he seeks to do. Well, our time is almost gone, but there's just one further point that I'd, I'd like to make that relates to the accuracy of the record. We've already noted the use of particular terms that have the colour of an eyewitness account and also, of course, an inspired account. But there's another term that I just want to draw attention to in verse 38, and it's this term, deputies. So verse 38 the town clerk says, Wherefore, if Demetrius and the craftsmen which are with him have a matter against any man, the law is open, and there are deputies. Let them implead one another. The revised version there for deputies says proconsuls. There are proconsuls. And as I put on the screen there, you note the fact that the term is plural. But actually, that's very unusual. Normally, there was only one provincial governor, a Roman proconsul, who travelled around the main cities trying the most important cases. Now, if, as F.F. F. Bruce has suggested in his commentary, Paul arrived in Ephesus in AD 52, and that seems very reasonable, and the riot in Acts chapter 19 then happened in AD 55, the use of the plural proconsuls almost certainly refers to a specific historical event. And it works like this. Nero became emperor in October AD 54. He was a great grandson of the emperor Augustus. Unfortunately for him, so also was the proconsul of Asia at the time, one Marcus Junius Silanus. 
Nero's mother, Agrippina, sent assassins to remove this potential rival to her son, and the proconsul of Asia was duly murdered. The two murderers, whose names are there on the screen, committed this act of murder, and then they oversaw the emperor's affairs in Asia, and may very well have taken over the proconsular duties during the interregnum between the death of Silanus and the coming of his successor. So for just a narrow period of time, there were two proconsuls, not one. You know, so often, brothers and sisters, as we read through scripture, it's the multitude of small details, such as some of those we've referred to this morning, the correct use of a title or other term, or the accurate historical background to an event that convinces us that the Bible really is an inspired record. It's God's word, and we can trust it. And God willing, tomorrow in our study, we shall move on to consider some aspects of the epistle to the Ephesians.